Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Jennifer Duvere Brody. I'm the faculty director here at CCSRE, the Center for Comparative Studies and Race and Ethnicity at Stanford. We are so thrilled to welcome you to the Mellon Arts Practitioner Fellow Artist Showcase. Um, what we're going to do today is hear from our four brilliant artists who uh, are sort of halfway through their term and hear about their projects and then uh, have a little question and answer period and open it up for you, the audience, to ask anything based on the individual presentations or anything else that came up during the event. Please use the Q&A function to ask your questions and we'll try to get to all of them if we can. I'm speaking to you today uh, from, you can see it's daytime, uh, Oakland, California, which is the land of the unceded Muwekma Ohlone peoples. Um, and it's also the uh, same territory and Stanford. So we're going to play uh, a very short land acknowledgement video that was made by two of our students, Azure Two Crows and Will Paisley. Then we'll begin the seminar. This land was and continues to be of great importance to Native people. We recognize that every member of the community has benefited and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land. Consistent with our values of community and diversity, we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to Native, Native people. Thank you. Um, before we get started and I turn over the virtual podium to all my colleagues here, I do just want to thank uh, Samantha who's doing captioning for us and this will be uh, available after the event we're recording. Um, so you can watch it um, later. Also Tim Jones who's here doing tech support. We also uh, want to thank Perlita de Cochea who is our communications and event organizer for the center, who's done tremendous work on this event, along with Marco Antonio Flores, who's our Mellon Graduate Fellow from Art and Art History. I also want to thank support from Rose Salceda, Professor in Art and Art History, the IDA Director, Alan Holt, Gina Hernandez-Clark, and Ellen O oh from the Stanford Arts Institute. Let me say a few words now about our theme, which emerged from an earlier presentation of the artists who've met virtually with us and one another uh, since they began their fellowships in February of this year. I've so enjoyed working with them and learning from them as I'm sure you will today. Uh, they will remain with us for a few more months to come and we hope that they'll be now part of the Stanford community for years and that we'll be able to display some of their work in the future. So the theme today is divine spaces slash liberational futures, which suggests a teleology where such divine spaces are the source for liberational futures. These are, as the solidus or slash shows, linked ideas. You will hear each of the artists address this crucial conjunction, either obliquely or more directly in their work. And with that, I want to invite Latifa our first speaker to get us started. Again, please put your press, uh, questions in the chat and uh, you'll see a fuller biography um, coming up in uh, the chat as well. Thank you again for coming to our artist Showcase. Thanks for that, Jennifer. And thank you all for being here. Uh, I am going to share my screen. Oh, except it says that I am disabled. Um, as someone who can share my screen. Okay, it works now. Try one more time. And uh, I'm gonna be offering you uh, 
a brief overview of three different projects that I've been working on during the, the tenure of my fellowship. Um, the first is uh, the Around Abolition Film Festival, which uh, is part of a um, laboratory that I have founded and I direct at the University of California, Riverside, uh, that's called MEMRES, short for the Memory and Resistance Laboratory. And it's a transmedia laboratory that makes space for artists, students, scholars, community members, and organizers to engage in a shared struggle for memory through undisciplined research and critical experimentation with media. At MEMRES, we understand memory as an urgent work that we must engage in in order to urge the liberatory futures that our communities need into being. And so the Around Abolition Film Festival highlighted five different films, conversations with the filmmakers, was an attempt to build a community of memory around uh, these urgent questions surrounding abolition. So um, it ran from May 3rd through June 4th of this year and featured films like Alex Rivera and Christina Ibarra's The Infiltrators, Eric Stanley and Chris Vargas's Criminal Queers, Kiri Dalena's Aluncina, Brett Story's The Prison in 12 Landscapes, and Setsu Shigematsu's uh, Revisions of Abolition. Um, so all of that documentation will be available soon uh, on the MEMRES website, which uh, later on I can drop a link for you all to visit. The second project I wanted to uh, share with you is an ongoing project around uh, the work of artist uh, Teresa Hak Kyung Cha. And um, Teresa Hak Kyung Cha uh, was a prolific artist uh, who's perhaps best known for uh, this book, Dicte, uh, which is a radical treatise on Korean history as told through the stories of revolutionary women. It was published in 1982, and I think the text still remains a groundbreaking one in its use of voice, poetics, languages, images, and a, a kind of freedom to traverse across historical moments to tell a very complex story about the Korean Wars, where Korea was at the center of a global struggle for power between Japan, China, Russia, and the United States, and where the North, where Teresa Hak Kyung Cha's family came from, was literally decimated. In addition to this book, um, Teresa Hak Kyung Cha was also an artist who worked across many different genres, uh, performance, uh, video, photography, and uh, expanded field of writing. And her trespass across genres didn't end there. Um, she was also the editor on one of the most important volumes of French film theory called Apparatus, which was the first volume to bring this theory coming from France to the United States. So she was incredibly prolific, a visionary for her time. And um, she's very well known to some who have been uh, exposed to Asian American or experimental literature worlds and still a very much unknown by many. And I would say there's also been a 40 year silence around the tragedy of her death uh, at the age of 31 in 1982, she was raped and murdered in the Puck building uh, in New York City. And this 40 year silence around the tragedy of her death um, has only been broken uh, by her brother, John Cha, who wrote a book uh, published in Korea around the trials um, uh, for her murder. And also um, perhaps most recently by uh, Kathy Park Hong, uh, who in this book published in 2020 called Minor Feelings, writes a chapter uh, called Portrait of the Artist around Cha's death and the silence um, uh, that surrounds it. And in this book, uh, Kathy Park Hong writes, uh, where does a silence that neglects her end and where does a silence that respects her begin? The problem with silence is that it can't speak up and say what's silent. And so silence collects, amplifies, takes on a life outside our intentions and then that silence can get misread as indifference 
avoidance, or even shame. And eventually, the silence passes over to forgetting. And uh, this has actually been something that I've been thinking about for a good decade, um, the silence around Teresa Hakyung Cha's um, death at an age when she was just at the cusp of um, such incredible work um, that for me uh, is really a kind of beacon of what is possible in terms of dealing with questions surrounding diasporic memory and historical trauma. Um, and so the project that I'm engaged in is actually a film around uh, this legacy of Teresa Ha Kyung Cha. Um, some new developments is that uh, I am collaborating on this film with her brother, James Shaw, um, who was Teresa Ha Kyung Cha's collaborator um, at the time of uh, her life and practice. So there's a, a film that she had been working on at the time of her death. Uh, it's called White Dust for Magnolia, for Mon White Dust from Mongolia. And the film um, has a, a bunch of fragments that she produced uh, in relation to it. Uh, treatments for the film, um, such as this one, where she describes the film as a simultaneous account of a narrative beginning at two separate points in time. The two points function almost as two distinctive narratives. The times overlap during the diegesis of the film, and a final conversion of the two points are achieved to one complete superimposition to one point in time. So in this um, brief description, you see that uh, you know, Teresa Ha Kim Cha in this film is trying to work across two different temporalities, one uh, with a first narrator who is a, a, a kind of um, amnesiac, who um, in her amnesia, in her state of amnesia could actually stand in for many different uh, women and figures um, um, of the Korean War. And uh, a second narrator who was uh, to be a kind of voice for this first narrator who was suffering from this amnesia and loss of identity. So um, the idea is to kind of inhabit you know, the fragments of the film that exist um, and bring it into dialogue with uh, a series of interviews and writings that her brother James Shaw has done working from uh, um, conversations that he had with their mother um, before she died. And that's collected in this um, unpublished volume that James is continuing to work on called Dragonwell, uh, which is the um, translation of the town where uh, their mother grew up um, in North, what is now North Korea called Yongjong. So um, at the Berkeley Art Museum exist uh, storyboards, shot lists for the film, as well as um, film footage that was shot in uh, the early 80s by James Cha and Teresa Ha Kyung Cha in Seoul, which was supposed to be the beginning of the film. So there's this, these fragments that exist. And uh, these are some of the fragments of the film footage. And so I think that the, the task uh, of this film is not so much to finish this unfinished film, um, White Dust from Mongolia, but rather to inhabit it as a structure um, so that we can think about uh, how it is that we are continuing Teresa Ha Kyung Cha's unfinished projects. What were the stakes of her practice? What is the unfinished project around history and memory that we can continue? And by uh, working within the armature of this unfinished film and bringing it into dialogue with um, uh, both the, the, the interviews with um, their mother that James Cha has done, as well as this question of uh, the silence surrounding Teresa Ha Kyung's death, I think there's an attempt to ask about the unspeakability of femicide and what this silence has produced in terms of um, thinking about the, the legacy of Teresa Ha Kyung Cha's work and thinking also about how um, in her own practice, Cha was working with these questions of silence and unspeakability 
through the utterance, through the murmur, through um, a kind of stuttering uh, way of um, working poetically with and through and across different languages, and to ask how that is instructive for us in also thinking about the question of violence against femmes, um, which uh, is an ongoing uh, interrogation in my work. Another part of the film is also to um, work with interviews with uh, friends, family, scholars, curators, artists, um, and to think about um, the, the kinds of uh, reflections that they have on Teresa Hopchung Cha's visual works, which are less known than her written works, and um, to ask what these works teach us about uh, um, uh, I guess, working in this space of di diasporic memory um, for the future. So uh, the other project that I will describe to you briefly is a book in progress that's called A Refractive Index of Femicide. And this is just a diagram of, uh, you know, what a refractive index is, basically how light passes through a medium. And so I want to ask about uh, femicide as being that medium um, and to uh, move across different discourses and um, historical sites in order to unpack it as a question. And the project was certainly inspired for me by the recent murder of eight individuals, six of them Asian women in Atlanta in um, three different spas. And I'm thinking about um, the discourses that surrounded those murders within a larger global history of um, militarism and colonial occupation. And so, for example, you know, this is an image uh, from the early period of U.S. occupation of the Philippines, where um, Filipinas were considered a site of sexual availability. Um, uh, uh, a kind of uh, refrain, I would say, that runs throughout um, the, the legacy of, of colonial violence. And this is just uh, pointing to other projects where I've worked on this um, pretty pointedly. This is a, a, a series of images from a project called White Gaze, where I was working with an archive of National Geographic magazines and unpacking the white gaze, but so much of that white gaze is really embedded you know, in that um, uh, site of uh, sexual desire, sexual availability across um, the Asia Pacific. And so I um, think about those histories in this book of colonial gender violence, um, not only as the event of that violence, but in the relations that exist across women um, and across generations. And in this text, I counterpose the languages used to describe the murder of uh, the eight people in Atlanta uh, with my own experiences as both a mother and a daughter. And this book is an attempt to give words to the many different wounds that opened up for me with these recent murders uh, and the strength of my desire to find a path forward toward collective healing and the reclamation of our lives and stories between being a daughter to a mother who has had every, has to do everything possible to survive and being the mother to a son and daughter who are still so young, I try to identify and locate the effects of the lessons that my mother ingrained in me regarding survival in this gendered and racialized body shadowed by empire and the sites of trauma, inheritance, and healing that can be found there. And, um, so this is an image uh, that's actually from uh, our, uh, my mom's photo album of a room that she lived in. This is not her, this is a friend of hers. And uh, in the writing, I'm really um, ruminating on uh, the background of the room and how I was not able to see it um, as a site that's embedded in these larger uh, colonial histories, um, gendered colonial histories. I actually don't know how much time I have left. Uh, I don't know if anybody can um, tell you me can if that's it. Like two minutes. Okay. Um, 
I think with that two minutes, I'll, I'm just going to read to you a, a very, very brief fragment of this writing, uh, just so you get a sense of the, um, the flow of it, the language of it, and some of the stakes of it. And it'll only be two minutes long. Uh, why is there a picture of you lying on a bed with porn in the background? I ask my mom, point blank, casual, offhand even. Her response is just as casual, offhand even a period to a question she had been anticipating since I was born. I don't know, she replies, as if I had asked her if the light in the kitchen were left on. The conversation ends there. I don't press. She doesn't say more. We never talk about it again. I don't know anything about this picture, and yet, with my myopic eyes, I intuit that it is my origin. It is what happens when I take my glasses off, an atmosphere felt but not seen that surrounds the making of my person. It is the viscosity, the tissue, the fascia, my root system. If I were to press, what would you tell me? That's not my room. I point to the background where an orange foot on the wall has your name on it. My friends and I were just playing around I see you all sitting in turns on your bed in front of the blonde on the beach with her ass in the air. You wouldn't understand. You never tried. I decided that none of these answers are helpful. They end the story. I need it wide open, billowing. I need to stay in the haze of my birth. Rather than bat the air with my hands, a futile gesture, I relax into it. I decide the goal is not for my mom to tell me the one impossible truth of this image. If it might be an origin, it is also the haze itself, felt but not seen, from which many truths might emerge. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Latifa. You are certainly putting words to wounds and speaking about the unspeakability of femicide, but with an eye towards liberational futures. Thank you so much for your work. We are going now to turn to our second artist, Kai Thomas, who will also be sharing some work uh, on film. Thank you. Hey, everybody, so happy to be here. Let me get this PowerPoint up. All right. Um, so it's really funny, like the timing of life. I found out the day I found out that I got the Stanford fellowship, I was in the camera rental house to like start doing reshoots for a change in name. I was like, oh my gosh, now we have this money and like we can add on different equipment. Um, but I am the director, producer, and cinematographer of Change the Name, and it's a short documentary that's going to be premiering at the Tribeca Film Festival next Thursday and then it'll have a virtual run uh, from June 18th to June 23rd and it'll be on BET on June 19th which I'm really excited about um, and for me during the course of the fellowship has really been like we did some additional shoots and also editing of the film and then working on the impact website for the film um, and I am going to play in the next slide um, a sizzle trailer that we cut uh, last summer when we started working on the film again to help secure funders. I was thinking about the major parks in Chicago. What, we got Douglas, White Man, we got Grant, Washington, Jackson, Lincoln. We choose to venerate the same kind of person all the time. So I'm like, all right, now, Park District, if y'all really want to make a change, y'all think y'all really want to do this, make it Frederick and Anna. I like that. Fine populated areas. Why do you think it would be important for us to canvas? Spread information about Frederick Douglass and Anna Douglass. Say so you are a youth organizer at Village Leadership Academy. Urge the board to be on the right side of history. 
or and to remove monuments to white supremacy. You can use whatever language you want, but you need to hit these topics. Do you have a moment to talk about our campaign to change the name of Douglas Park from Stephen Douglas, who was a slave owner, to Frederick and Anna Douglas, who are free and fighters for black people? Do we agree that was fine? You feel like we spread the word? Yeah. A little bit, right? I need some water. All right, cool. So in this photo is myself and the lead participant, Bianca. And the way this project kind of started was a collaboration between the two of us as co-directors. I think documentary, unfortunately, can be like a very extractive process for some filmmakers coming into certain communities. And I really wanted to do something different and see what it would be like to give, you know, a participant, the individual that's featured in the film. I don't like the word of character. I'm like, this is a real breathing person who has like a real life and a real existence. To what would it look like if they had agency and like the editorial process and also to build someone up to be like, okay, Bianca, if you wanted to make a film without me, that could be a possibility. Um, so we worked on the film last summer when the folks started reorganizing. And then I was contacted by Tribeca Studios, which runs a program with Queen Latifah where they support uh, black women uh, filmmakers. And I ended up partnering with them. And in that partnership, we ended up having a conversation because they are like a traditional media institution. It didn't make sense. And like the schedule that I would then be put on for us to continue as co-directors. So now in this iteration of the film, I am the sole director of the film. But I think something that is really important is like relationship building with participants. Cause it's like, you're not gonna know when to film if your participant doesn't trust you or if you know, you like aren't in community making your film, you'll end up getting a text or seeing something on social media. It's like, yo, like, why didn't you tell me about that? And I think it's really important to be honest with participants in the process. I have other films that I've worked on that have been like in development for a long time and like to get something out of production and to like raise a full budget um, is definitely a feat. And this was the first time because Tribeca came on board because Proctor and Gamble and Queen and Tifa that like, I was able to secure a real team to tell this story at a certain level, um, which has been definitely really exciting. Um, so for me, I really prefer what's called verite filmmaking, which is really observational in nature. I typically don't have sit down interviews in my films. And this is probably the first film that I made that is like a mix of verite footage and also sit down interviews. And it definitely forced me to grow because usually I'm also shooting the films entirely by myself. But once Tribeca came on board, they're like, hey, like we want you really to just focus on directing. Like you need to hire a camera person. And I think as an artist, like so much of it is in my head and, and isn't something that's like readily communicable to people. And it's something that I really had to work on to be like, okay, this is how I frame things. And it has definitely just been a huge learning experience working on the film. And I think, you know, a big part of this initiative is the idea of like widening the screen and that we have more black creators telling black stories and having like adequate resources to be able to do um, uh, the projects that we want. Process, I was really fortunate to uh, have Paloma Martinez who was actually an alum of the Stanford documentary program uh, to be the editor of the film. A few years ago, I had seen a short that she directed and edited herself called Crusanto Street um, that ended up getting distribution through The Guardian um, and POV, which is like public television shorts. And I knew from seeing that short that she would understand the importance of like a youth voice. I think, you know, unfortunately, we don't see a lot of films from the perspective of young people. So it was really important for me to find an editor who had previously in their work done a short about young people and did it in a way that was like tasteful and not like kids don't know what's going on because I think young folks really do what, know what's going on in the world. Um, so after we did our additional shoot dates in February, I ended up going out to Salt Lake City, which is where Paloma was living at the time for about two weeks and we kind of just storyboarded um, different scenes that I had imagined and, 
and we started our first week of editing was maybe the third week in February and we ended up picture locking um, I think mid-May and like finished color and sound and all of that stuff um, at the end of May um, and delivered to Tribeca and to BET. And this was a really interesting process for me too because normally when I'm working on films, and then send that to an editor and be like, hey, this is kind of what I imagine and have someone like fine tune and rearrange scenes. Whereas like, I never opened up a editing software as it relates to this film. Like I rewatched footage. I was like, okay, these are selects that I'm interested in. These are scenes that I'm interested in. These are the people that I really feel like we can include. I think one of the biggest lessons that I've learned in the editing process is I'm not a filmmaker that's like an outline filmmaker. I'm not like, you know, before I start shooting, these are all the scenes I imagine, or even with the pickups, there weren't like, okay, I know these are the exact sound bites that I need to kind of bridge scenes together. And I think going forward after having had this experience with Paloma is to just like be even more intentional if I ever do another film that is gonna have rely on interview to, to bridge storytelling. Um, so as you can see through the um, post-its is we use different colors to coordinate different themes and different stickies for different people. Um, and like this film has probably had 10 different openings and like 10 different endings um, and different structures along the way. And it has been really amazing to have worked with her um, in that process. And so that process sometimes looked like you know, us reading transcripts from the sit down interviews and like highlighting be like, okay, these are the selects that we like, or, you know, going back and playing a scene in real time and being like, okay, you know, this really works well here. It doesn't really work well there. So it was a true collaborative process with her. Um, and so, like I said, we're gonna be premiering at Tribeca. And I think for me, in addition to having spent really the last six months only working on this, I also was like fortunate to create some free time to work on other friends projects and for other companies. Um, I, in addition to directing, am a director of photography. So I get hired to do camera work on a lot of other folks' projects. Um, and two projects that really stick out to me is um, my friend, Rosita Cox, who is actually graduating this weekend from Northwestern's documentary MFA program, um, did a series of interviews of folks in relation to like the uprisings that happened here in Chicago. And it was really powerful because I hadn't had an opportunity to really like process everything that happened last summer and to hear from other young black folks in the city and to like create an archive with her was something that was really powerful. And then obviously a lot of folks with um, Judas and the Black Messiah, there's been like renewed conversations about the Black Panthers in Chicago and Fred Hampton. And I was able to collaborate with Vox on a video series that they did uh, which was really amazing to meet this professor who has like literally wrote the book on Fred Hampton um, and just to like learn more. And it's been really awesome to be in this fellowship. My mind is a little combobulated at the moment because I have the premiere next week, which I'm really excited for. Uh, but I really look forward to everyone's questions and having had this space to check in with the other artists in the program monthly. And I think in terms of like the thematic idea of like divine space and liberation. I think every time I do like a press interview about the film, I'm like left with more reflections, like particularly this idea of like, what space can black people be at where they're not like attacked or like questioned for being there, right? Like when have black people been able to like really just be at the park chilling? And like, what does that mean that there are parks and monuments and places in places that, you know, are vestiges of white supremacy and like the changes that need to happen for that to no longer be the case. And just like the idea of like, you know, black bodies loitering is like not like, is like frowned upon. And it's just like, yo, black folks just wanna be able to hang out and like go to the park. And I'm excited and like honored to have told this story about these young folks who came together over the course of three years who you know, really challenged systems and bureaucracy in the city of Chicago to get one of the major parks renamed to Freedom Fighters, Anna and Frederick Douglass. So thank you again for y'all's time. Thank you so much, Kai. Um, 
watching this develop and then hearing you talk about your process, I think is so valuable. So um, more, more to come with that. And also, you know, what a perfect story um, to be telling in this moment, you know, after and going through the racial pandemic and COVID-19 and also thinking about the connections with uh, Latifah's work and some of the other artists that we're about to hear from. And I forgot to say that this is also called the Mellon Arts Practitioners because it's part of a group funded by the Mellon Foundation who has its own project on uh, rethinking monuments and also um, is in conjunction with other artists in an even bigger community we're making um, who have fellowships at Brown, Yale, and University of Chicago, our sister schools. And with that, I really am excited to um, welcome our next speaker, artist Sandra De La Losa. Great, thank you. Um, uh, thank you for the support. And, and uh, just also wanna give thanks to the conversation and camaraderie with my fellow uh, cohort. So I'm gonna go ahead and jump into my presentation and move to screen share. <clears throat> so um, the project that I have been working on uh, during uh, my time with, with Stanford is a, a project uh, that will be an ongoing project. Uh, this will be the first iteration. And the working title is Unsettling the Settled Archival Glimpses of Abolitionist Futures. And it's a project um, that is a unfolding of, of my continued practice that investigates uh, invisible histories, um, and I'm also deeply inspired by also the work of Nick Estes in Our History is Our Future, in, in which he turns uh, to um, the past and looks at traditions of indigenous resistance in the, in the United States. And I'm doing that in a, a similar vein within this project. I'm turning to the past uh, and also the present to find instances in which former carceral spaces have been reclaimed by communities or also the land itself. So for this first iteration, I'm focusing on one jail, the Lincoln Heights jail, um, but I've also begun research and begun investigating other sites, including a uh, former woman's prison, civil brand in, in uh, Los, East Los Angeles, and a former courthouse, the Kenyan Juvenile Justice Center um, that now is occupied by the Youth Justice Coalition. So my plans uh, to, for this project are to circulate it uh, via art exhibitions. Um, the work that I'll be showing you today is uh, kind of preliminary sketches for uh, installation uh, that will be multimedia and have, have different components and will be part of Undoing Time, Art Histories of Incarceration um, that will be held at Arizona State University Art Museum in Phoenix this, this fall. I also plan to um, turn this research into a, an artist book of, of of some form that includes uh, experimental writing, uh, photography, collage, and transcriptions of interviews I conducted for this project. So yes, this first iteration focuses on uh, the Lincoln Heights jail. Um, this is a photo of the jail today in its current state. Uh, the jail is located in Los Angeles, California, and it was built in 1927. It was the principal city jail. Um, and it was a, a second wing was built in 1951 and it was decommissioned in 1965. Um, so, 
I am investigating the history of this jail, both as, as when it was a jail um, and functioned as a jail, and also it's after aftermath. Uh, the space after it's it was decommissioned was a, housed the Bilingual Foundation for the Arts for a couple of decades. It was a community gym. It was a site for film sh shoots. But in particular, my project fo focuses on its iteration in the 1990s, in which the southern wing uh, of the first and basement floors were um, occupied by community members, and it became the Aslan Cultural Arts, Arts Foundation. Uh, the jail today, um, its fate is uncertain. Uh, there, uh, there has been a a request for for uh, interest in redeveloping the building, and one group was selected to redevelop the building in 2017. So my initial steps were were, and a big part of how I spent my time uh, during this fellowship has has been in a gathering phase. Um, and just uh, working on collecting an archive of the Aslan Cultural Arts Found Foundation. Um, and so my goals <coughs> uh, in focusing on the Aslan Cultural Arts Foundation were are one primarily just also to, to um, unsettle the dominant narratives um, of the jail but also of, of the 1990s. Um, in collecting archive of Aslan, I am gathering a counter archive um, that contests the constructed narratives that were generated in the 1990s um, of the so-called inner city as degenerate, crime-ridden, um, that also co, that also, um, co-resulted co in also the, the formulation of a genre of film, we could call uh, gangster exploitation films, which uh, demonize black and brown youth, all in the midst of an era in, in which, um, uh, in, in which a, the de a new economy is arising in the deindustrialized uh, city. Um, these narratives were used to legitimize the mass investment in the building of prison and industrial complex. Um, so while, while these, these, these realities are unfolding um, at the Asan Cultural Arts Foundation in the 1990s, simultaneously another space is, is be, being created amidst the construction of, uh, of um, these the physical, economic, and ideological uh, um, construction of, of, of what we now call there of the prison industrial complex, um, a community occupied uh, this former jail and created a cultural space. Um, the Asan Cultural Arts Foundation was open for about eight, to eight years from 1991 to 1990. Nine. Here is it was created by local artists, community organizers, musicians, writers, um, some who had just graduated from college, some with no, no college education, but all with local ties to, to local communities. Um, the intention of the Aslan Cultural Arts Foundation was to transform a place of oppression into a place of liberation, as I quote the, the former director, Armando Martinez, who I had the pleasure of um, interviewing for this project. I also want to share that also I, my own his personal history is, is connected to this space as I was a part of the, of the collective to help run this space for a few years. Um, and also um, some of, my research also gave me time and space to actually spend time entering my own archives and finding old photos um, uh, that documented different events. Um, so this is one photo, uh, a, a band resistant 
militia performing for the first farce of July, an event that has still continues. It will be, there'll be an iteration of it. I think the 23rd iteration of it uh, um, this year. Um, and this is, this was in 1997. Uh, Las Aslan Cultural Art Foundation, there had hosted over a thousand events. It had a Saturday indigenous school, had numerous benefit concerts, uh, cultural events, gigs, uh, theater, different art classes. It was definitely a place that supported um, a, a vibrant era of cultural production in a very, very difficult social, political, and economic time. Here's a flyer um, <clears throat> of one event. And um, this was shared by uh, a friend, uh, Billy, Billy Branch. Um, and so a lot of, of the archive that I was collected is not from an official archive. Um, it's really the, the organic archivist who housed uh, their old flyers, photos, videotapes in, their, in garages and, and homes that make up this, this archive. Um, I believe this archive does document an unfolding conscientization, if I use the Ferian term, an evolving, growing uh, collective consciousness um, filled with act critical th thinkers and active bodies who create an, an, an alternative space via art and cultural production in the 1990s. Um, this is a flyer actually that was shared uh, shared by uh, Jorge and Leal, now professor at uh, UC Riverside in the Department of History, um, who uh, who participated in a burgeoning young burgeoning rock and español scene in, in the early 1990s, um, comprised of first generation Mexican, Central American, and other Latinx immigrant youth amidst the rise of, of, of the anti-immigrant rhetoric and le legislation spearheaded by political figureheads like Pete Wilson. Um, and who, um, uh, I want to throw a shout out to all these or organic archivists in the case of Jorge and Leal um, as a uh, archivist participant in, in this subculture um, who would go ahead and, and um, uh, parallel to my own work, uh, become a, a scholar and begin to formalize uh, this history. I'm going to show a fragment from a clip shared by Jorge Leal. And this was the, uh, the first Huateque, a series of concerts that happened at, at Aslan Petrarch Foundation um, that, that brought together bands from Baja California and the local local Hispano scene. And this is the parking lot of Aslan Petrarch Foundation. Stop share there. So, um, <laughs> also a photo uh, taken of an event, the a benefit for Big Mountain in 1999, uh, and a photo of Tongvin scholar, storyteller, activist Cindy L. Tree. So the, the archive will be, be 
will be part of one installation within uh, my larger installation in, in Undoing Time. Um, oops. Oops, sorry, I lost a slide. I'm gonna. Oh. Um. As I, while collecting the the archive, I've also um, did uh, video studies of the center in its its current state. And so um, this documentation will be interwoven with. Uh, uh, edit versions of video interviews that I, I conducted uh, on the history of, of the jail. I document the facade of the jail, its, its edges, its surfaces. Um, I'm also document the, the jail in relationship to the ur urban grid, uh, thinking about the jail in the context of, of the city. One of my goals is to, to uh, kind of blur these, these notions of incarcerated, unincarcerated, and look at the various um, modes of policing and co controlling uh, working class communities of, uh, uh, of uh, working class commu communities of color, not only through carceral institutions, but through other modes of, of um, policing uh, and control, such as segregation and uh, insti the institutions of, of the media and schools, and also um, um, family and So, um, so the second component will be comprised of a, a two channel video installation and uh, the footage of, of the jail will be interwoven with a case study um, of, of the, an event um, in which you, a youth subculture bachucos of the 1940s were targeted and uh, demonized um, and um, Social tensions erupted in what, an event called the Zutsu riots, um, in, in which this this numerous uh, youth were rounded up and uh, were jailed at at the space. Um, that story will be told through interviews with various um, interviewees, including uh, scholar Kat Ramirez, who wrote, wrote a book, "Women in the Zut Zut." and um, who also uh, provides a wider view of understanding how youth of color were policed historically and how, how the policies instituted at that time, uh, the legacy they've gener generated within the city over the last half of the century. And uh, finally, um, as an artist who works in the, the archive, um, Part of my process is processing, taking in, breaking down, and transmuting the material um, that I gather and, and work with. with. Um, so a third component, component of my installation um, will um, be a series of collages uh, in which I work to transform, work with the stuff of history, work to transform it and create new cosmologies. Uh, this, I'm conceiving of this installation as a series of collages on light boxes um, using color transparency and reproduced archival material, um, which I'll create an archival cosmology uh, that imagines liberated futures. So with that, I will end and thank you for your time.
Thank you so much, Sandra. That's just, again, amazing work. And we start to see some connections around archiving, memory, history, transformation. Thank you. Um, last but uh, not least, our fourth artist to speak is uh, Mary Valverde. Hello. Um, can you, Sandra, can you um, unshare your screen so I can, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning. I'm Mary Valverde, uh, an artist based in New York. Um, wanted to uh, land recognition to the Lenape people. Um, honored to be uh, one of the four artists who are sharing the progress and process of the CCSRE Fellowship. I consider myself an interdisciplinary cultural practitioner. As an artist, I create installations um, reminiscence of sacred spaces and material offerings. Um, my primary focus is on visual arts and cultural research. Um, these uh, offerings propose relationships between form, measures, and marks, uh, intending to diagram the visceral. I often work um, with ephemeral material. Um, sorry, I often work with ephemeral material and uh, that are meant to expand and contrast depending on the space. I also spend a lot of time doing art uh, studies and drawings in between my large projects. In my artwork, I try to create visual networks um, on arithmetic diagrams. So in essence, I am trying to chronicle and archive patterns and examine uh, the ways that they empower uh, and adorn space, our bodies and our minds. Um, So this image here is, um, you're looking at my research images and examples that have inspired my CCSRE project. Um, they are examples of pre-Columbian textiles and ceramic tiles and huaca structures. I looked to the patterns and palette and geometry of these objects to inspire the design and organization of my work. Um, the title for my CCSRE project is Huaca Number no. Two. It is a second iteration of an ongoing research um, that I started earlier last year. Um, it's been a uh, difficult year for the obvious reasons, COVID, um, but for my family in particular, because we lost my mother in October. So this uh, heavily influenced my intention and the direction of um, my project and creatively in general. Um, so huaca is a Quechua word and it, um, a Quechua for sacred space, a space of veneration, an object that holds spiritual or divine charge, meant to mark a place of contemplation and divine connection. Uh, in essence, it is a place, it's a point, it's an object all at the same time. So like many languages that were not originally written, um, it does not mean one thing, therefore it's really difficult for the English language to translate and encompass all its meanings and uses. Um, so this image, um, I had an opportunity to install a huaca this past January, um, and these are sketches of my process for that work. Uh, these are sketches of how I created the circle and a square modules made up of incised three-dimensional folded paper that were individually hand cut, uh, folded and painted. Um, there are also images of ideas of how it would hang and relate to the gallery and to the audience in the gallery space. Um, also a sketch of the pattern arrangements uh, on the floor. Um, this image is a final installation and floor detail of that Huaca installation I created for the Latinx abstract exhibition in January, 2021. Um, at Brick New York. 
um, which just came down earlier this month. Um, as you can see, it is a large scale installation. The palette and the geom geometric sequencing of the wall is inspired by textiles. Um, the modules were then arranged to create an embedded Chacana symbol in the overall design of the wall. Um, and the floor piece is inspired by the geometry found in ceramic tile images. It follows the sequence and patterns to create the labyrinth design. Um, this image, um, well, for my CCSRE project, I am continuing with my research in pre-Columbian visual culture and creating a second placa, uh, one that can theoretically be reinstalled and reconfigured in a variety of ways. Uh, the waka will fun function as a conceptual marker um, of a place and illustrate coordinates of overlapping space and time. So it, it will offer a conceptual access point to cultures um, and uh, ancestral uh, symbols for uh, both indigenous, indigenous and African peoples of North and South America. So this image is the first creative step, um, which is the color study for the overall palette of my uh, projects. Um, after many choice, after making choices about the palette, uh, I work on the layout and pattern of the colors into the overall sequence of the modules. Um, these images are sketches for possible color sequences and overall design that help me figure out how many of each color I need to create to uh, make my final piece. Um, this slide describes how I make the modules of a single color group, which is on the left side and put them into module of multiple color groups on the right. Um, at this point, I've made uh, all 72 pieces that are required to for the construction of the en entire piece. Um, this is an overhead shot of these modules organized into three separate columns as proposed in the original sketches um, that you saw a couple of uh, slides earlier. Um, so, and uh, this slide shows how the three columns um, uh, shows them in, in one overall color and pattern arrangement. And the right side is a detail of how they merge together in certain cross sections. Um, Right now, I am starting to work on, the, work on the backs of these pieces and the backs with um, will be black and gold mimicking the, the floor design, the labyrinth design of the first waka from the beginning of my presentation. Um, this slide shows sketches. Um, this slide shows sketches of my pot of some possible ways um, with, that I'm going to try to connect the modules into groups. On the left um, are diagrams of variations of a single column or a grid group. Um, and on the right are diagrams of possible arrangements of those groups once they're connected. Uh, I'm playing with the idea of folding, different, creating different folds and three-dimensional pa uh, patterns with those uh, connected arrangements. Um, so, Focusing on abstraction allows me to consider my lived experience and, um, I, and the need to connect to my ancestral history. Uh, Quechua is an indigenous language of pre-colonial uh, South America. It was not a written language. Uh, this made it easier for colonizers to write their own versions of history and um, more easily erase our stories and language and culture. Uh, I consider my research and art an attempt to study the vast and sophisticated vernacular in pre-Columbian material culture. Uh, the study of the colors and patterns and sacred geometry utilized in the culture is a way for me to connect to a history and a language um, that, it, that I lost. Um, through no fault of our own, we were stripped from our culture and language in varying degrees. Um, and my work is a way to have agency for my culture and my history and connect to lost knowledge and understanding. Um, and that is, that's it for my presentation.
That's fabulous, Mary. And I want to have the audience note that you saw some of Mary's work, uh, which helped to inspire the design for our invitation. Um, can we just take a moment to do a round of collective applause before we move on to the Q&A? And please put your questions in the chat. But I'm, this was just wonderful. Thanks to each of you. Um, I wanted to maybe uh, take a, just a, a moment to ask a kind of broad question, um, which I think some of you, each of you really uh, spoke to, which is um, our mission here at CCSRE is to advance racial equity through interdisciplinary education, innovative research, which you all do, um, and community engagement, also a common thread through all of them. So maybe can you ask, or do you wanna talk about, um, I'll ask each of you about the way the arts in particular, um, intervene and speak to and work with those ideas of interdisciplinary education, innovative research, and uh, community engagement around racial justice. Thank you all so much. I can go. Um, for us with making the film, you know, having like a new level of financial support to do it on a bigger scale, it felt really important for us to make a website that could be more expansive than what the film could capture in 20 minutes. Um, so through the support of the Field Foundation, which is an organization here in Illinois, um, the lead participant and I were able to partner with a website designer and to hire a local um, writer, Natalie Frazier, and to work with Guy Mount, who was a former professor at the University of Chicago, who I think is now at um, Auburn, um, to write some histories about Anna and Frederick Douglass, as well as Stephen Douglass. Um, and that was something that was really important to me that like, a film is not just like the physical thing that you're seeing, right? They're like the interactions that I have with participants that like don't make the final product, you know, all of the pre-production meetings, all of the interactions with like the editor and like the people on the post team. And then as it relates to like public facing things, it's like, okay, we wanna make sure that whatever information we're not able to include in the film that we have like a written or visual component on the website and to also be accessible for folks because I think, sometimes filmmaking can feel like a very um, mysterious field of people being like, okay, well, what actually is the financial breakdown of how you all spent money in the project? How did you all decide to you know, hire certain people? I think a lot about when I was having the editor search, I did wanna prioritize hiring a black editor, but because of the moment that we're in, like at a certain scale, like everyone was booked. I was like, okay, you know, if I can't have a black editor, I want to have like an editor of color at least. And it was really interesting to like put call outs on Twitter about the project and have like white folks respond to me and be like, hey, like I want to submit my resume for this project. And it's just like, this is not click for you, like no shade, but like I'm trying to work with someone that like understands like a project that is moving from being like self determined that had like, you know, this level of funding to now being this other thing and just like, wanting to put people on because like a lot of the folks that we ended up hiring to be um, department heads or people who like had never done a full film on their own. So like our editor Paloma, she had edited her own film. And I, I even think about our composer, John Key, he had never composed for a full length project. He had only done like commercial spots and is usually like a drummer for um, like Solange and other folks. So like for him, like that was a growth moment. It, it was really important for me as a director Director on the project to find people at growth moments because like now both of them have that for their resume right and it has been like a really interdisciplinary team because I think so often folks are like oh if you haven't done this exact thing already like we're not going to hire you to be on the film and I think that's why the industry is so stagnant and like you know, money and access are a real thing, right? Like whoever, we're in a remote moment, the individual who sound mixed our film is like a person who's like similar in age and me, like he does not have an elaborate setup, but he can still do the same thing at his home. I'm not gonna go to like some big name post house because like now we have the money to be able to do that. And I think that's something that I wanna continue to do and to like be a resource through like this impact website that if someone was like, hey Kai, can you walk me through how this film came to be that like everyone who we hired on the project would be willing to sit down with someone. Um, so that's kind of how I think about it for us. 
I think that's so fabulous. And it really does speak to education and how do you bring more people in who have been excluded from the means of production? You know, in some ways you can think about too, that too as, as the kind of ideal for education. Um, and I know a couple of you actually teach uh, in the university. Do you wanna have a response or say something a little bit about uh, opening this up, I mean, to also the communal aspects? Um, I, I wanna second Kai's uh, sentiments where um, I always think it's really important for, for artists of color to work with um, other artists of color, especially um, so sort of like work horizontally instead of vertically um, and to offer access to um, people who may not um, have everything going for them or in terms of monetary uh, access. But I think one of the things that um, this project or this opportunity offered to me is uh, an, a moment of reflection in terms of time and space, like literally instead of conceptually, but how much time I have now to not worry about the money I'm gonna put into this project and to uh, envision something without limitations and what would be the best possible scenario. Um, but also it made me as a professor um, consider, um, you know, how, do, how, how would my students or any other young artists or any, any artists of color access the work and, um, you know, I want, I really want students of color to know that when they're picked to participate in prestigious universities or institutions, they're picked because they're exceptional. So, you know, those institutions get more out of you being there than you get out of um, being in this, those institutions because you have so much to offer um, in terms of insight and lived experience. Um, so, and sometimes you end up teaching your professors about you and your lived experience. And I think that um, as people of color, you, you know that your perspective is valuable and necessary. So that in any position like this, always uh, know that you have a great deal of talent and ingenuity and um, perspective to offer the audience. And there is an audience for your work. Any other comments on any of those aspects? Um, I mean, I think maybe I'll just say one thing that's been always powerful for me is, is the worst thing to be the only one. Um, and so thinking about how we bring our people with us, um, a lot of you are mentioning sort of questions of the archive of remembering history of those that came before in that kind of model. But, um, you know, part of the hope of this work and what's I think been joyous for me is uh, you know that I get to see all of you as a collective and it's not just you know the one person who's there to do the work in in, in the kind of hyper individual singular sense if that means um, you can I'll, I'll jump in um, yeah I mean I think one thing that like artistic processes can enable um and one thing like that has influenced my like decision not to pursue an academic route but to participate pursue art artistic was was just uh, to create other methodologies that other honor ways other ways of, of knowing um so within the case of like my my research while well, while well, i'm definitely influenced by um and engaged in in the work of critical theorists. I've, I've found some of that work really, that discourse really, really help, helpful. But I'm also able to simultaneously practice other methodologies, such as walking, such as um, looking and investigating and uncovering uh, um, infrastructures of the land that point towards uh, other understandings of of the processes of what now we now call settler, colon, settler colonialism, and to physically be present and physically um, build that relationship with 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 the land, and also uh, artistic processes have have allowed me to then find ways and to process to not just conceptually or intellectually process. Um, 
these questions and histories that I'm, I'm absorbing, um, but to physically process them. So a certain, certain allows a certain type of em embodiment. So um, yeah, so in other methodologies, I, I'd say um, I've been able to cultivate uh, in my role as artist. Uh, I'll add something here, which is we often think of uh, you know, politically engaged, socially engaged art as um, uh, the practice of shedding light on something that's invisible or not seen, um, such that you know that circumstance of injustice can be known by many or by all. And um, I think in my practice, I'm um, always problematizing that as an idea in so far as that um, uh, it's it's one aspect you know an important aspect i think of a, of a practice it's a pop it's a possible path but not the only path and the problem that i have with uh when um you know the idea of uh, politically engaged art becomes collapsed with that um uh, that mode of of working is is its address because the mode of address is precisely to a kind of universality. I'm going to tell everyone what's happening here. Um, and in order to believe that everyone's idea might be changed or that consciousness might be shifted, one might still need to invest in uh, that, the idea that, um, that, that, that that address to the center can have some kind of effect. And, um, and I think that, you know, in I think certainly in many of the collective projects I've been involved in and in the, um, the kind of purview or um, intent or vision of the Memory and Resistance Laboratory, the question really becomes about how it is that we talk to each other and build together the futures that we need uh, to see. And for me, again, uh, that comes back to a question of address. You know, when um, we're talking to a universality, what gets lost are um, precisely the spaces of intimacy, of um, mm -hmm. of a kind of fragile uh, articulation of our experiences and lived the lives that we live. That um, that is as much a part of describing the politics that we live in nuanced ways as the larger macro politics that. Uh, macro political histories that we might use. So, um, so I'm, um, you know, really thinking about these questions of address in the sight of invisibility and um, unspeakability, unknowability, um, and how it is that we can wor work not to try to make visible to a universality, but instead to articulate in and with each other, and that that is the site um, of. Of, of the work to be done. Yes, that's really beautiful. Thank you. And I think that's that's true for each of you uh, in terms of how you're complicating access to the past. I was struck in reading through some of that uh, script that you showed uh, Latifa of the part where she's saying her past is speculative, fictitious, imagined. And yet that is, I think, still part of verite to use uh, the term Kai did, which we think about in terms of making cinema, but it means, also means like truth. And I think that um, those telling the truths from these spaces of the lived experience, whether that's uh, Sandra's you know, remembering and going into her personal archive or the struggle to recover, right? The language that you uh, know and yet don't know because it, it's been taken away from you, Mary. I mean, I think each of these um, projects really speaks powerfully uh, to some of those artistic, but then also aesthetic and political questions, you know. Um, do you have any questions for each other or any last words? We're almost at time. Um, I'm just so grateful to each of you for sharing your work and I'm excited that we still have more time together. I just wanted maybe uh, as we're waiting to uh, say that we have a, someone in the audience who's wishing that they'd had such a community or group of role models as yourselves and when she was in college or they rather in uh, college or grad school. And I'm just reading this, this is Lilia, Lilian Garcia-Roig. 
um, I'm sure my work would have rather looked different and I would have had some support in digging into ideas and issues that were dismissed at the time. So that again, I think speaks to that question of from whom do we learn? Mm. And how? Maybe each of you just one word about uh, inspired by that comment from the audience of, you know, where you get your ideas. Again, you spoke to it in your presentations, but maybe we'll just conclude with that. Um, I, I want to just uh, say that participating in, in this fellowship, absolutely. Um, to me, I'm, I'm so inspired by the other artists, um, not just um, their individual projects, but their, who they are um, and how they function and their vision um, and their ability to really um, narrate their thoughts and um, creative ideas. And I think that I'm really inspired because they're, they're, they're all tackling such huge um, subject matter. And right now um, it is imperative that artists see the value in themselves and the value that they have in their community. So I, I, I really am inspired by you guys. Um, and I'm really, I think it's wonderful that I got a chance to meet all of you. Sandra, you're muted. Oops. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I will share that like uh, building cre community, uh, creating community has been such an important part of my life's journey and uh, something I continue to work on and, and deal with. And, and that takes many different iterations, um, whether it be through my work as an activist and being aware that, um, yeah, the work I'm doing and the, the, the histories I've, I'm investigating are of a landscape that is alive and shifting and dynamic and new paradigms are actually being envisioned and being built with this thing we call gentrification. So collectively doing research and understanding those processes have, have been really important or whether it be to deal with my own uh, historic and, and uh, ancestral trauma through inner praxis of various types of healing uh, and ceremonial communities, um, or or the the collective communal efforts and the the um, projects like I'm I'm investigating that do begin to uh, to document um, these kind of collective processes. I I want to share a, a quote that I was going to read in my my presentation. I didn't have a chance to written by. Uh, um, Potawatomi botanist Robin Kimmer in Braiding Sweetgrass. To have agency in the world, ceremonies should be reciprocal co-creations, organic in nature, in which the community creates ceremony and the ceremony creates community. Thank you so much for sharing this, Sandra. I think it has really been awesome and also just like crazy for me that literally every month that we met, I was like in a different city, either editing or working on a different project and to really feel like an abundance recently. And like we as like a group have talked about that a lot you know, in terms of like the focus now on artists of color and if that will be sustainable and like trying to, you know, you know, survive with the resources that we have. And like, I feel like a real kindred, like connection to Mary every time we're like on Zoom and we're like talking, cause I think we're both just like very frank individuals are like, hey, this is how we show up as artists. This is what we want from people. Um, and like, even what you said of like telling your students that when these prestigious institutions reach out to you that like you deserved it and you earn it. Cause I definitely remember getting this email of being like, wait, what, I got the Stanford Fellowship, is this right? Um, and just being like, at every stage we are like learning and becoming and like ne nothing is ever, ever final. Like, I think all of us in, you know, the various age ranges is like, we don't create art now like we did previously and like being okay for the future versions of ourselves as artists and like giving each other like 
space and also accountability to be like, hey, these are the things that like really resonate and are really shining with me or like, hey, I would love to converse with you about X, Y, Z. So if anybody ever comes to Chicago, I'm more than happy to like hang out. And also I know you guys on the West Coast and Mary, I definitely want to link when I come to New York. Um, but it really has been an honor and like no one has like any ego or anything in this program, which has been really, really amazing. I think that's a, a perfect ending <laughs> uh, and more to come. And again, just from the bottom of my heart and you know, intellectually, you all um, have formed an amazing community and we're all grateful. And uh, we will see more of one another and we hope everyone in the audience um, so thank you, thank you, good luck, see you soon. <laughs>